What we're gonna do right here is go back. Way back. Back into time. Cavemen. Cave women. Neanderthal. Evolutionary detective Danny Vandermini, reassessment of Neanderthal behavioral ecology, has produced striking new insights into what Neanderthals really look like. Anthropomorphism, our propensity to see Neanderthals much like ourselves, has blurred Western thinking on all Neanderthals. Anthropomorphism has been a ubiquitous feature of human culture since the Stone Age and has influenced the way scientists have interpreted the archaeological evidence. The problem with forensic reconstructions, Vandermini says, that factual reconstructions work extremely well for humans, but that's because we know the shape, texture, and thickness of our facial soft tissues. Forensic reconstructions are fine for humans, but when human features, textures, and dimensions are used to recreate Neanderthal faces, they're bound to be wrong. After all, you'd never use human facial dimensions and textures to recreate the faces of chimps, gorillas, or any other non-human primate. There are many reasons that chimps and other primates provide a better analog for reconstructing Neanderthal facial characteristics, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight we're with our buddy Ted Holden. And without further ado, let's get to that conversation right now. I hope you enjoy. Ted's upset. He's got an extra grind. He's got a beef. So we got here right now. Neanderthal. What do I want here? I want the, the this thing at, at first here, which says Neanderthal nature. It's like what I want to talk about is the question of hominids, particularly the Neanderthal. Okay. They actually are, right? Because there's so much garbage out there on YouTube and on other places on the Internet. Okay? Yeah. And at home. the Neanderthal for the last... 60 or 80 years has been presented as a kind of a poster child for kumbaya, you know, pseudo-religion, you know, for yeah. yuppies, right? Like, oh, yeah, we're all just sort of alike, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, this is a picture from the late 1800s, right? Yeah. Um, the nature of the Neanderthal, late 19th century scholars understood what they were seeing, right? I mean, they started seeing Neanderthal bones and remains like in the 1830s or 40s, I guess. And by the 1870s or 80s, I mean, they knew what they were seeing at least, right? This is Marceline Boulle's reconstruction, okay? Yeah. And I want to go into some of this stuff. Okay. You've heard the name Ignatius Donnelly. There's a book, in a couple of books of his are still, still known. Right, one is called Ragnarok, the Age of Fire and Gravel. The other is called um, Atlantis. This is this. Donnelly was a sort of uh, Renaissance man. I mean, he was either a governor or a U.S. senator from Minnesota yeah. for a period during the 1860s or 70s. Right, um, mm -hmm. a very interesting sort of a guy. This is what he has to say. So it's in another cave in the Neander Valley, right, of the Neanderthal near Hoch, Hochdale between Düsseldorf and Elberfeld. A skull was found, which is the most ape-like of all known human crania. The male to whom it belonged must have been a barbarian brute of the rudest possible type. The horrible and beast-like proportions of the Neanderthal skull speak with no less certainty of undeveloped, brutal, savage man, only a little above the gorilla in capacity, a prowler, a robber, a murderer, cave dweller, a cannibal, a cane. Yeah. Right? So it's a safe bet that Ignatius Donnelly would not have allowed his daughter to marry such a person. You know, that, that seems obvious enough to me. So these guys knew what they were seeing, right? I mean, what we've right. been seeing, like in, in magazines and in journals for the last... 60 or 70 years has been concocted since that time, right? It's basically garbage. Early write-ups of the ongoing study of Neanderthal DNA, so the, the, they began to understand DNA in the 1960s, right? Describe that DNA as roughly halfway between ours and that of a chimpanzee. Some more recent articles describe Neanderthal DNA as closer to that of a chimpanzee than to ours. 
Here you've got an article in New Scientist, right? Um, Roxanne Kamsey. So the first comparison of human and Neanderthal DNA shows that the two lineages do diverged around 400,000 years ago. I mean, that's obviously out to lunch, right? But the rest of the sentence makes sense, and that Neanderthals may have had more DNA in common with chimps than with modern humans. Why do you suppose it is they don't want us to know that? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I don't have a good answer to that one, Greg. Is it really just all about we're all just alike anyway? Is that really what it's about? Uh, one world government, right? Um, yeah. You know, whatever you want to call it. This is a, you know, this is not a reconstruction. They have real footprints from real Neanderthals. You know, this is from a cave, like I believe in Croatia. Yeah. I mean, this is not like an ape's footprint, but it's certainly not human. Yeah. You can see this, right? I, oh, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's substantially different from anything that you would call a human footprint. There's no way in the world. I mean, you can't just wait until the next time it rains, go find some mud, and try to make a footprint like that. I mean, it won't work. Right. They have a complete DNA picture of the Neanderthal genome now. It's like, you know, they, they almost have, like, a, like, enough information to just start, you know, try to find a way to create one of them or something. It would be a stupid thing to do. The decades of the 20th century, the Neanderthal became a kind of a poster child for Kumbaya pseudo religion. As New Zealand scholar Danny Vandermini notes, popular images show him as a slightly different human. This is the kind of picture that you see. If you just get on Google and just type in Neanderthal, right, these are the kinds of pictures that will turn up. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, and if you do <laughs> Chromag, man, they, they give you some freaking freak. Okay. Um, as Vendermini notes, all such images are wide of the mark and do not match up with what we actually know about the Neanderthal. Here's a sort of a listing of what we know about Neanderthals, right? Yeah. No, the Neanderthal DNA was roughly halfway between ours and that of a chimpanzee. Okay, that eliminates any possibility of humans being descended from Neanderthals via any process resembling evolution. Okay, and it also... It also completely it eliminates any possible of human possibility of humans being descended from hominids altogether. Okay, because the Neanderthal is the closest hominid to us. Okay, anything else is going to be further back. You see, and that, that basically says that what they're trying to do now is just stupid, right? In other words, the claim that you read anymore is that we and the Neander humans and Neanderthals must be cousins, right? In other words, we must have had a common ancestor, like five a last common ancestor 500,000 years back, which they normally take to be Heidelbergensis, which is a type of Homo erectus. Yeah. Now, a Heidelbergensis would probably look about as scary to a Neanderthal as the Neanderthal looks to us. Right. right. So, cool. me, you know, so in other words, the problem is that too genetically remote to be ancestral to is a transitive relationship. In other words, you know, for somebody to claim that, well, ne the Neanderthals are too genetically remote from us to be ancestral to us, right, therefore we must be descended from something further back, you know, the Heidelbergensis. That's like right. claiming that, like, dogs and wolves are too, ge too genetically remote one from the other. For dogs, you know, for dogs to be descended from wolves, or, or say foxes and wolves are too, too remote, you know, for the one to be descended from the other, therefore foxes must be descended directly from fish. Right. Yeah. That's kind of like what you're saying. That, that's that's just silly. Um, <clears throat> the Neanderthal skull was a good match for an ape's profile, a very bad match for a human profile. That's the first thing that Danny Vandermini no noticed. Right. You could just yeah. about shove a, a, a Neanderthal skull into an ape's profile and it fits. There are no Neanderthal needles. Cro-Magnon needles are common. That is, early human needles are common. Okay, as long as humans have been on the earth, they've had needles, right? They've always needed clothing. A creature with a six-inch long Ice Age fur coat doesn't require needles. Yeah. Okay? Nobody's yeah. ever found the first Neanderthal needle. Um, Makes sense to me. Footprints more ape-like than human. Rib, rib cages, conical. As of those of the primates to make room for all this gigantic upper body musculature, you know, the musculature that you need to haul a 400-ton body up into a tree, right? Our rib yeah. cages are cylindrical, okay, so that basically our skeletons don't look like those in Neanderthals. 
Eye sockets and nasal areas are much larger than ours. Placements of noses and eyes on faces are much different, much higher than, than for humans. Okay, the mindset, right? We know that the mindset of a Neanderthal was similar to that of an African lion. He viewed the living world as neatly divided into two categories, that is, his own family group and meat. They're cannibalistic. So that you find Neanderthal families, you know, the remains of Neanderthal families, you know, clear butchering marks made by flint and knives. Yeah. We know from uh, Rob Gargett's studies that if you put the skulls of a human, a Neanderthal, and a lion together, the two which have much of anything in common are the Neanderthal and the lion, okay? We know, yeah. in other words, you know, you've got like an apex predator, right? I mean, you've got something which really, you know, it doesn't really have any sort of a, a, a mental picture uh, uh, of organization beyond his own family group, right? So that says the largest group of Neanderthals that you're ever going to find is probably 15 or 20, okay, living in one place, organized. You're not going to find an army of 3,000 of them, right? Right. We know that the Neanderthal could adapt to an omnivorous diet when it was available, but for the most part, particularly in the European Ice Age, he was, for all intents and purposes, a pure carnivore. Okay, the, the analysis of, of the plaque on, on Neanderthal teeth indicates that we're eating like 99% uh, meat. Okay, we know the Neanderthals weren't giants like the skeletons that we were finding in the Ohio and Illinois valleys, right? Right. It's like a tall one, it's sort of like the Eskimo of the hominid world. Okay, a tall one might be 5'10 or 6 feet tall. But a male Neanderthal could easily have stood 5'9 or 5'10 and weighed 300 or 330 pounds with no extra weight on him. Okay, so looking at a creature which is built much more heavily than one of us. Okay, you have, you know, if all of that sounds strange, you have to ask yourself, what you would expect a creature with DNA halfway between ours and that of a chimpanzee to look like. And the real answer to that is very much different from popular depictions, and the implications are that the late 19th century scholars were substantially more on target the, the, than most of our more modern efforts have been, right? In other words, they had this stuff right in the 1880s and 1890s, and scientists lost their way, right? The first thing Danny Vendermini noticed was that a Neanderthal skull was a very good fit for an ape's profile and bad fit for a human profile. Take a look at this. This is a Neanderthal skull and a chimpanzee. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, that works, doesn't it? It sure looks like it to me. Now, when you, um, Danny Vendermini here has the line of the Neanderthal's skull going forward, right? He's got the Neanderthal looking forward, and when you do that, then the Neanderthal has a snout like a dog or a cat, and, they, you know, the yuppies don't like that. You can see this picture here when, for the most part, most depictions of Neanderthal skulls show them, as it were, looking down at their feet to avoid the appearance of them having snouts, to avoid them appearing to be prognathic. Right. You see what I'm saying? If you really yeah. want, the human is looking forward in this picture, the Neanderthal is looking down. If you turn this, you, uh, to make this believable, you're going to have to turn this Neanderthal skull, rotate it to the right a bit, like maybe maybe 10 degrees. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. You know what the mainstream story is on that? No. They say that the prognosticated snout is because they eat a rougher diet and get stronger jaw muscles. That's what they say. Oh, no. No. Yeah. That's... Yeah. No, I mean, you've got, like, variation amongst modern humans, right? But you don't have anything like this. So Danny, no, he no, has no. the Neanderthal on the left is looking forward. And you can see that he's got a snout. You see what yeah. I'm saying? Of course. And the eyes are, you know, the first thing you notice about Danny Vendermeen is repro reproductions of the eyes. Just a fabulously bug-eyed sort of a creature with a fur coat. This is what a Neanderthal looked like. You just have to look at a Neanderthal skull and just look at them huge eye sockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These these are dark world eyes. These are the same kinds of eyes. I'll get to that in a moment. Purple dawn, yeah. Yeah, these are purple dawn eyes. Yeah. One of the yeah. first things you would ask would be, what's the deal with the eyes, right? Rob Gargett, who calls himself a subversive archaeologist, notes that even if you try to draw a more humanized or yet amplified Neanderthal with the eyes and nasal areas as large as the bones actually indicate, 
what you end up with is still outlandish. Okay, this is Rob Gargett's yuppie Neanderthal with eyes and nose the right size. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you've got something which cannot be made into a human, really. It's like you've got something which is very different from one of us. Mm -hmm. These are creatures from the same age, okay? The Neanderthal was always viewed as a primitive human because of, rather than as an advanced ape, largely due to the size of his brain, which is actually a bit bigger than ours, right? But the Neanderthal brain was dominated by the area of the brain involved with vision, while ours is dominated by the area involved with creative thinking and logic, right? That combined with the huge dark world eyes indicates that the Neanderthal brain was largely the neurophysiological equivalent of the circuitry for a military night vision scope. Right. Okay. Now, of all the of all Danny Vandermeer's thoughts going into this, I've just got two very very minor quibbles. You know, to my thinking, the fur could easily have been reddish rather than dark gray or charcoal colored. And Danny Vandermeer he also draws the Neanderthal with slit eyes like a house cat. Okay, because he assumes that the the Neanderthal was diurnal and saw both daylight and Darkness, right? I don't believe the Neanderthal ever, ever saw anything that we would call daylight. Okay. Yeah. It could easily be that the final extinction of the Neanderthal came after you had daylight on the Earth. They simply yeah. weren't able to deal with daylight. Here yeah. you've got like several of the leftover creatures, you know, lemurs, tarsiers, bush babies, right? And they don't have slit eyes. Do you see what I'm saying? Of course. The cute little guys, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, owls. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's a cool name. Right. The question remains, what was the original purpose of those kinds of eyes? Nothing in our present world really corresponds to anything like that. In particular, so you note know, the lemurs and tarsiers do not have the kinds of slit eyes which you would associate with diurnal creatures. Okay, so that's those are the two microscopic quibbles that I have with Danny Vandermeer's reconstructions. Okay, now there's another part of Danny Vandermeer's theory which I do not buy into, and that is this idea of claiming that predation from the end by Neanderthals drove drove more gracile hominids into a fast process of evolution, like Gould and Eldridge were talking about, into Cro-Magnon man. So that to me does not make sense. So there was a, there's no run up to Cro-Magnon culture, right? In other words, if that was believable, then you would have artwork and you'd have fancy tools amongst you, you know, those more gracile hominids, and it just isn't there. Those, what they call school cops of hominids, are just other hominids. Okay, yeah. there's a vastly better solution to the problem of humans and, and you, know, you know, Neanderthals. So, the answer to the riddle is, as they say, a long story, that is, the riddle of the big eyes, right? And here I go into just a couple of paragraphs about Saturn theory and what what that was about, right? All the old pantheon religions were astral in nature, the same as the name associations between pantheon gods and planets being primordial, and two of the planets, Jupiter and Saturn, were what we call dwarf stars in the recent past. Primitive people seeking to construct an astral religion under present conditions would end up worshiping the sun and the moon and possibly Venus, right? The average person can find Venus pretty easily, and yet, the two chieftain gods of every one of those old religions were not the sun and the moon, they were Jupiter and Saturn, the two the two right. stars, not the sun and the moon, and particularly Saturn. In fact, articles appearing in the Journal of Assyriology in the early 1900s noted that pretty much all the names associated with the sun in the ancient Near East were names which had originally been associated with Saturn had afterwards been switched. Okay. Vestiges of that ancient reality are still all around us. We still call our Sabbath Saturn's Day. The chief Roman religious festival was called Saturnalia. Plato consistently refers to antediluvians as nurslings of Kronos or Saturn. The Greeks called Saturn Kronos. And numerous classical authors refer to Saturn having presided over a golden age of sorts on Earth. The cult religious practices which we read about were originally meant to restore that golden age. Prior to that golden age, there had been an age of darkness, which many indigenous traditions refer to as a purple dawn or a dream time. The golden age was likely within the last 10,000 years. The 
Purple Dawn was the primordial condition of the planet, going back as far as the planet goes back. Rocky bodies like Earth and Mars, aligned with a brown dwarf star such as Saturn was until recently, would generally reside inside the plasma heliosphere of the dwarf star. Trey McLaughlin describes the state of affairs like in this book of his, which is called Saturn Death Cult. And on the internet, that's SaturnDeathCult.com, and you can find this. You know, the timeless age and a purple haze. It describes the um, purple dawn. This is a picture of Troy McLaughlin's, okay, of Neanderthals in the purple dawn age as we would see them, right? Now, I like this next picture. Troy doesn't care so much for it, but I'm going to go with my own judgment here. I think these two pictures should be shown together. The one is the way we would see this picture. This is what the purple dawn with Neanderthals walking around would look like to us, the upper picture. This picture is probably very close to what a Neanderthal would see or what a human with a night vision scope would see. Okay? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So that's what you're dealing with. Now, I've got a couple of other little short documents here which I wanted to take a look at. Humans versus hominids, okay. the major differences. Okay. The Neanderthal and presumably other related hominid groups were land predators, well adapted to the conditions on this planet some tens of thousands of years ago. The thick fur coats were adapted to ice age conditions and the huge eyes were adapt to adaptations to the perpetual twilight of the purple dawn age, which scholars like Wardu Cardona and Trent McLaughlin describe. SaturnDeathCult.com. Okay. The Neanderthal was not diurnal, would have had difficulty dealing with direct sunlight, so simply never saw anything that we would call daylight. Okay, humans are totally different from all of that, and are basically aquatic mammals. This is the difference, right? Elaine Morgan listed a hundred or so, the author of The Aquatic Ape, right? Or, you know, she has, has two or three other books which, which describe that she's the chief author of the, of the idea of, a, of an aquatic ape theory, and she lists a hundred traits or characteristics which we share with the aquatic mammals. There are a few which stand out, okay? Voluntary control of breathing, which is an adaptation for swimming and diving. We take that for granted, but monkeys and apes don't have it. It's the only reason they can't teach chimps and gorillas to speak English. They can be taught to communicate using deaf signs perfectly well. Face-to-face -face sex, right? Marine mammals do that. Land animals generally don't. And humans do that. Okay, shoulders adapted for swim strokes, and this is big, right? The motion to swim is the same motion as to throw something like a javelin or to use it a ladder. And this was a huge edge which humans had over the Neanderthal, believe it or not. Humans have that, primates and hominids never did. That's why the Neanderthals were limited to thrusting spears while the early humans had ladders, and the ladder was a fearful weapon, and javelins. Okay. Yes, range weapon. Especially the atlatl. Now, if you've ever seen a hard serve in tennis, somebody like, you know, Andy Roddick or Roscoe Tanner, you know, hits a hard serve, right? It's like most of the power is coming from his wrist, right? In other words, he's trading four inches of wrist motion for four feet of racket head motion. He's sending a tennis ball across the net at 140 miles an hour. Okay, now, if instead of a racket and a tennis ball, you've got this hooked stick, you know, which is basically an atlatl, and then a six-foot-long thin spear, which is indented in the rear. The hook for the atlatl fits into the, the, the indent in the spear. Then you're doing the exact same thing. You're trading four, four inches of wrist motion for four feet of, uh, of motion of, the, uh, of that atlatl tip, right? Uh, but you're not setting a tennis ball. You're setting a, a six-foot-long spear out at 100 miles an hour, and you don't want to be standing in front of that. I mean, that may actually have even been a more powerful weapon than a bow and arrow, right, you know. Not as accurate as a bow, right, but more powerful. So that's why Neanderthals were limited to thrusting spears while early humans ha had atlatls and javelins because of these kinds of shoulders that we have, you know, from, from being aquatic mammals, right. The lack of a decent sense of smell. You know, this is the thing which, which you know, the last item here, uh, which I consider to be crucial. All land prey animals have vastly better senses of smell than humans do. If they didn't, they'd go, very, go extinct very quickly, right? In other words, if you were to give deer our sense of smell, I mean, deer would be extinct within a month. You know, it would just be an effortlessly free meal. 
you know, every predator that ever laid eyes on them. Elaine Morgan lists something like 100 such character aquatic traits. Her theory can be viewed in two ways. Viewed as a new version of evolutionism, it's just another flavor of BS, right? I mean, however, viewed as a theory of human adaptation, it's the best theory that has ever come down the road. Viewed as a new version of evolutionism, it is just another flavor of BS. Viewed as a theory of human adaptation, it's the best theory that's ever come down the road. But it's never gotten any traction in academia, and there's two reasons for that. There's no fossil evidence of any sort of an aquatic ape ever having lived on our planet. And there's never been a body of water on this planet which would be safe for humans to live in. Now, you've only got to spend, this is what I tell people, you've only got to spend 10 minutes in the ancient sea monster section of the Smithsonian Museum to comprehend why humans have never lived in water on Earth, right? It just needs a different mm. world to happen on. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I was going to say, just give me a second here. You drove it home for me when you said that we share 50% of our DNA with a banana. So that kind of makes the 2.3% that they say we share with Neanderthals null and void. Oh, look, it's like Troy isn't even convinced that, that, that we actually do share any any. DNA with Neanderthals, it's up in the air, right? Now, assuming that we do share DNA with Neanderthals, it doesn't, you know, for us to share any DNA with Neanderthals from interbreeding, it would have to have been a very common thing. It's, it's never, that, that, that's just completely impossible, right? It's like, I, I don't even know where to start with this one. It's just for, for humans to have interbred with Neanderthals or hominids, it's like what, what you're requiring is, you know, in such a way as that they'll leave genetic traces in the human race, right? What you're requiring, what you need for that is for some Neanderthal male to have raped a woman, you know, and then rather than cooking and eating her, eating her afterwards, as usual, right, you're going to keep her alive long enough to bear a cross-species child, right? And then somehow or other raise that child to reproductive age, age and have him or her blend back in into human, breed back into human population without anybody catching on. I mean, come on. You've just seen these pictures of what these things look like. You really think you could have something like that, produce a child with a human woman, right, and then have that child breed back into human populations and nobody's going to figure it out? Uh, I mean, that, that's ridiculous, right? In real life, it's like it, it just wouldn't work that way. Neanderthal females would kill that woman the first time her new owner left her alone for five minutes. And even if that didn't happen, it's like, you know, the whole thing wouldn't work out any better than these experiments the, the, the communists were doing in the 1930s trying to rip breed super workers, you know, by crossing humans and apes. Right? That didn't work out very well for anybody. I am the Frankenstein monster. <laughs> I have bolts in my neck. I'm electric and scary. There's no good way to look at that one. If there are any Neanderthal genes in modern humans, it would come from eating Neanderthals and not from having sexual relations with them, okay? Um, now, the first experience modern humans ever had with Neanderthals is watching friends and family members get eaten by, killed and eaten by them. So that eating a Neanderthal, which had just been killed in a battle of some sort, would just be sending the Neanderthals a message in their own language, okay? Do so not got a bring that of, fire like, near me. In and war party tracing around in the Alps, traipsing around in the Alps, you know, along about four o'clock, three o'clock. I don't know. They fight some kind of a pitched battle with the Neanderthal family. Yeah, we talked about this. I yeah. remember. Right. You've got like Neanderthals lying around dead, right? And these guys are like, you know, what are we going to eat here? You know, it's like, you know, it's been a hell of a day, right? But I mean, I'm hungry. What is it we eat around here? What do you think they're going to eat? You know? Yeah, well, you, you're preaching to the choir. It makes sense right, right, to me. Right, right, right. No, I mean, that to me makes flawless sense, right? But you get these, um, in one, uh, there, there's one case in particular. We've got this company called 23 and Me, right? Like 23 pairs and in, in one of the genomes, right? Yeah. And these guys are having yuppies do mouth swabs, right, and send DNA samples in, and then they're sending them back for however much they charge them some sort of a readout that says you are 1.375% Neanderthal, right? Neanderthal. That's, everybody better yeah. look out for me, you know, like I'm 1.375% Neanderthal. Wow. Have you ever heard of a worse scam than that? Yeah, no, not really. Well, probably, but it's up there. I'd like uh, to know how much Chromag I got in me. <laughs> um... Well, that gets into another kind of a question. 
That question says that you basically, as near as Troy and I can tell, and we could be missing something on this one, but it's like, you know, there appear to be two, human, two basic human groups on the planet. See, I have nothing to do with race or color. It's either group, group could produce any color or any feature that you'd ever see. Well, that makes but, sense because animals do the same thing. Now, let me tell you what these two groups are. One is the, um, the Bible antediluvian group, you know, which starts with Adam and Eve, right, and goes through Noah, and then, you know, the story that you read in the Bible, basically. Yeah, you know, what about the Denisovians? Denisovans, okay. Um, I don't believe there is such a thing. The Denisovans are, are basically, you know, the whole idea of there ever having been such a thing as Denisovans, as far as I know, is based on one finger joint bone. That's not much to hang anything on. No, not at all. Okay. I, I mean, if they actually were any sort of a separate group, then they would be similar related to the, the Neanderthal. Human groups, look, you've got the, um, the okay. group, which is most of us, which is descended from Adam and Eve, and then you've got the group, which is the indigenous peoples of the world, which are Cro-Magnon descendants. In other words, the group descended from Adam and Eve basically first appeared here like five, four, five, six thousand years ago, I mean, as per the Bible, right? The other group, which is the group descended from Cro-Magnon man, whenever they got here, which could be more like 60,000 years ago, or it could be more like, you know, which would be like what you normally read about, you know, like, these groups include, like, the Spanish Basque, they include the, the, the Georgians, right, they include a number of North European groups, they include the people of the Canary Islands, originally at least, the Gaunch people. They include probably most Native American groups. Probably. Okay, now genetically the two groups are all the same, right? I mean, they're easily interbreedable, right? I mean, it's like all humans, to my way of thinking, are one family of, uh, of creatures. But the original, you know, the original cultures and technologies of these two groups were, were vastly, vastly different due to this gigantic span of time separating the two saltations, right? Uh, and there's any number of things, right? Um, technology and culture weapons, right, the atlatl and the boomerang. The atlatl was the signature weapon of Cro-Magnon groups. It's simply, you know, the Western world, uh, you know, the classical world didn't, never knew about it. It's like where to start, right? The weapons of the Bible, the sword, the spear, the sling, and the bow, that's it, right? I mean, Alexander was constantly on the lookout for improvements in projectile weapons, and he had jav his soldiers had javelins and slings, and the atlatl is a, is a superior weapon to a sling or, or, or a javelin. But apparently Alexander had no way of finding out about atlatls, right? I mean, the knowledge was unknown. You understand what I'm saying? Have you ever really taken much of a look at atlatls or? Well, not in real life, but I know what they are, yeah. Let me um, just real quick like give you an idea of the power of this thing. It's like, it goes into constructing a lot of primitive technology, spear thrower, right? He's going to show you how to construct an atlatl from nothing, right? Just, you see, he's just taking a forked stick, right? He's going to have these little barbs up there at the end of the atlatl stick. Oh, okay, I just lost my little mouse pointer here. It's better, watch. Yeah. Maybe go to where he's showing you how he uses the thing. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. You're going to get an idea of the power of this thing. He's not even exerting himself there. Watch this. He's going to set himself up a little target. That looks like 40 yards there. I mean, I wouldn't want to be standing in front of that. And that's without even... Uh, that's just the crudest possible type of spears. You see what I'm saying? Now imagine, that, like you're in a Roman army or Alexander's army, and you've got wood lathes, right, arrow lathes, and you can make something like that that was decent, right, that was like, you know, smooth uh, and straight, I mean, completely straight, and had a steel point on it instead of just a hardened wooden point. The idea of a stone age, right? It's like I don't think there was ever any kind of a stone age amongst the people of Genesis, right? Troy thinks that they may have been using stone tools just to avoid having metal in their hands, you know, with all of this static electricity in the air. 
you know, before the flood and before the Tower of Babel, all that sort of thing. These are some of Troy's um, Ganymede hypothesis uh, images. You know, like what, you know, the, the, this perfect human home world would have looked like. Remember I said that like a human home world, you know, this planet was an ideal home world for Neanderthals, right? I mean, the Neanderthal was very well adapted to this world the way it existed 50,000 years ago. Humans are not adapted to the way this world, you know, we're not native to this planet. This is the world that we were native to. Okay, I mean, an idea, a human home world is going to have to be bright because of the, the tiny, relatively tiny human eyes. Okay, I mean, humans aren't going to thrive in this dark world that the Neanderthal lived in. It's going to have to be wet because of the aquatic adaptations. And it's going to have to be safe. I mean, there can't be any sharks. And humans don't swim as efficiently. You know, you know, I mean, there can't be any sea monsters in this original human home world. You understand what I'm saying? And it would help also sure. if there was protection from cosmic radiation, which would be like this intrinsic magnetosphere, Ganymede. Ganymede is the only other body besides Earth in our system that has an intrinsic magnetosphere that, that would protect it from cosmic radiation. Basically, Earth replaced Ganymede. Um... As a human, as a primary human world in our system, yes. Yeah. Okay. Here you're seeing the sun and the dwarf star here, like floating bergs of pumice, right? That, that one, the, the, the most major key feature on Ganymede was pumice. Okay, you had coagulated bergs and, and floating masses of pumice, and then you also had anchored, anchored islands of pumice in prehistoric times, right? You're seeing both Jupiter and the Sun here again. You've got a seven-day transit. I mean, Ganymede goes around Jupiter once every seven days, I believe, and it's like parts of that seven-day period where, you know, it would be fairly, you know, it wouldn't be as bright. You'd have bright parts of it, right? It's like you would have, like, one part of it where you'd be seeing intense, you know, both full light from the Sun and the light from the dwarf star might look something like this. Yeah, that looks good, Ted. I've never seen those pictures before. These come from this new book of Troy's, okay, which is called... Yeah, that's the, outstanding. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. You know, but this is what you're looking at, right? It's like you're looking at a totally different kind of a world. It's like uh, John Cook claims. This is the guy that spelled his name J-N-O and pronounced it John, right? claims that Jupiter would have been in just a, a bit closer to the sun than the Earth is now under those point, kinds of Point seven AU. Yeah, point seven AU. Okay, no, I figured figured you might like this. About Neanderthals that you could put out there. Like I said, there's a lot of, there's a big market for it. Oh, yeah. People just don't know where to go, right? It's like, I believe, I've got these two groups on Facebook now. One is called Ganymede Hypothesis, the other is called Neanderthal Realities, right? And I believe that the, uh, I'm getting up around 250 members now for the, the newer one. And I believe that's going to get bigger eventually, right? Because people end up doing these searches on Neanderthal all the time. And I just wanted there to be some chance for somebody to come up with real information, you know, just by getting on Facebook and typing Neanderthal in. And, you know, you've got four or five other Facebook groups, you know, which deal with Neanderthals, which are just spouting garbage. As people get fed up with mainstream, they're going to start looking for alternatives. You would think. I mean, you definitely. Right. I know you're doing a hell of a job. I mean, just getting Velikovskian type lore out there. The more people learn about Velikovsky, I mean, his material speaks for itself. Yeah, that's well, good stuff. The guy was very, 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 very bright sort of a guy. Very good writer. It's like he, you know, English was like about a fifth or sixth language to him. And he wrote, his English writing is as good as you could hope for. Oh, for sure. His vocabulary was wonderful. Uh, Charles Ginnenthal, I, I got, I read a few of his articles. I don't know if you've seen the videos, but. You said you did some work for him. He's a brilliant man, brilliant okay, man. Okay, look, there's two. Uh, I've put a whole bunch of his stuff out there. Look, it's like you've got a website, which is called emmanuelvelikovsky.com, 
which is Charles Gannenthal's materials, which are relatively unformatted, right? And then on lulu.com, all you have to do is type in Charles Gannenthal. You've got like 12 or 13 of those books of his, which are formatted, right? They're e-books. Oh, yeah. His books are good reads. Okay. And in fact, being on Lulu, it's like you could, you, you, you could get those from Amazon for Kindle just as easily, right? But it's like... You know, if you have a copy of um, of Caliber or something like that, then you can read, you know, just generic e-books, right? And, you know, he's got these, th this massive work, which is called Pillars of the Past, right, which is four volumes, right? Each one of these volumes is four, five, or six hundred pages. What are they about, Ted? Because I'm, I'm intrigued by that. It's about, like, the chronology of ancient history. It's about... You know, what do we really know about like a stone age or like a bronze age or an iron age or anything like that? Or what do we really know about, you know, the way some of these nations that you read about in the Bible or in other history, you know, how, how were they actually living? What were they up to? What were the real time frames? It's like, you know that you've got like, you know, you, you've got like a couple of cases of, of things where the standard chronologies are just can't begin to be right, right? You've got... The, you know, like the question of Joseph of the Bible, the coat of many colors, and then this uh, grand vizier, vizier. I'm not even sure. Vizier, okay. You've, you've got like a... Hi, Greg. I've got like a sort of a roommate sitting here. That's Hello. Long story. Big but fan, dude. Yeah. Greg, you there? Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, I'm keeping it myself on mute so that uh, you don't pick up any room interference, and yeah. plus I don't want any feedback from my mic. Yeah, it's it's good, Ted. By 1,800 years, and the life stories are identical from the day they're born until the day they died, right? The life stories are just absolutely identical, right? One that's, quick that's, question about Pillars of the Past, because I'm thinking about getting one of them. Which one would be the best one to get? Oh, I would start with number one. I would, okay. I would start with start at the beginning of anything, right? No, Imhotep, right? Imhotep uh, and Joseph. The funny thing is that Joseph is not any normal type of an Israelite name, right? It's like, where in the world does that come from? The only, you know, you've got Joseph of the coat of many colors, and then the next time in the Bible that you see the name Joseph is like, you know, Mary's husband, right? So, like, how does that work? What I believe to be the case is that, like, Hotep, you know, it doesn't yeah. take much to get from Hotep to Joseph, right? Or, or That's Joseph, pretty right? good, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I was thinking Jupiter and Mary was Venus, but you might be right, no. yeah. But, but I believe that Adam and Eve are, are, were real people, that Noah was a real person, that, you know, and it's like you could easily believe those were all just Saturn or the moon or Mars. Yeah, or, yeah, well, at some point it has to be real people. Yeah, I mean... You know, the, too much is written about Adam and Eve, right? You've got a book called the Book of Adam and Eve, which was excluded from the Bible, right? Now, it's like Genesis reads as if Adam and Eve were created here at Nilo. The Book of Adam and Eve reads as if they were brought here. It reads almost more like a science fiction work of some sort. Um, what, are your, what is your take on the Book of Enoch? Uh, interesting. No. The, a bigger question that I have, I don't know how much you can make out of, out of the Book of Enoch. It's like, you know, you can try to interpret that all, all kinds of different ways, right? But it's like you're still only talking about the last five or 6,000 years, right? And this is the difference between Troy and I, Troy and myself, and the Thunderbolts group. So the Thunderbolts group is, they're not really talking about anything which is outside of the last 10,000 years or thereabouts, right? Whereas... What Troy and I are talking about is more like within the last 50 or 70,000 years. You understand what I'm saying, right? So, Of course I do, yes, uh, and I, I get that, too. One of the biggest question marks, to, you know, what I would really, you know, one of the things I'd really like to have an answer to, which I don't, is this whole question of what you call a, um, an antediluvian peace, right? Some sort of an age sitting back there, which may have been part of this golden age that you read about, where you didn't have predation, right? Where all the animals were nice to each other. And I just nothing, saw something on that. All the animals were not good to each other. Nobody ate anybody else. It's like, you know, the animals were all kind to humans, right? 
the Bible talks about that. It's like Nordic mythology talks about that. It's like, you know, pretty nearly every antique nation has its own version of something like that. So it's hard just to throw the story away. By the same token, it's very hard to picture any sort of an age like that on the earth, right? In other words, you know, if it's hard to picture lions and tigers and bears just eating, you know, subsiding on veggies, you know, for three or four thousand years before the flood, then try picturing like a, a, a hyena don or, or a terror bird or a, uh, you know, a carnosaur of any sort, you know, like, you know, I mean, they couldn't live on anything other than meat, right? It's like, you know, their, their, their digestive systems, e even just ordinary lions and tigers, right? It's like the digestive systems are made for dealing with meat, you know, not made for dealing with veggies. Okay? It's like they couldn't live. I mean, you could put a cat into a room with chocolate bars and cookies and cakes. It'd starve, right? Exactly. Right. Humans, you know, are omnivorous, really, but it's like the original human diet almost had to have been some kind of a combination of, fi uh, of shellfish and fruit, right? And particularly since humans don't swim as efficiently as the other aquatic mammals, humans to be spending 10 or 14 or 15 hours a day in water, you have to burn up a hell of a lot of energy, right? And the, 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 the fuel for all that came from fruit, right? They just walk up onto these islands of pumice, right, and just pick fruit and eat it, right? And, of course, the problems that humans have now is they've still got this taste for, for sweet things, but they're not getting all that exercise anymore, right? I mean, you know, we've got refined sugars and, you know, we've got, like, you know, corn syrup and all this other, other stuff anymore. So you get, like, people, I mean, like in this town where I live, it's got half the people walking around badly overweight. Yeah, yeah, obesity is definitely a problem in the U.S., that's for sure. Right, right, right. I mean, in 1955, there was no such thing as a fat child, I mean, at least where I was living. Oh, I know. There, now it's, you see them all the time. Yeah, oh, I know. It's like half the kids I ever see in Victoria, Texas were, like, badly overweight, you know. Like, it was more, I mean, you know, there was no way for a kid to get fat in 1957, right? I mean, couldn't do it. You're walk, walking a mile and a half to school, you know, 40 minutes recess, an hour, hour for phys ed, right? And then walk a mile and a half home and then play football until it got dark, right? Well, how are you going to get fat doing that? Yeah. Hey, Greg, I noticed, uh, Greg J, I am a fan. I, I remember when uh, you picked Ted up about a year ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, this, this is good enough. If you can make like maybe 30 minutes worth of, out of, of anything out of this. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right. I thought you did well. I, I'm really intrigued by these new pictures. Do you got anything else? Is is there more to scroll down to, or are you at the bottom? Uh, that's pretty. That's, that's sort cool. of the bottom. That's some crazy stuff, isn't it? Yeah, I got some great subscribers. They're smart too. They're not dumb. You might want to include like a link links to both uh, SaturnDeathCult.com. Oh yeah. And I was going to do a story from Troy's uh, website because, you know, I'm into it right now. I'm doing the Saturn theory. So oh. did you see my last video from Ev Cochran? Yeah. Ancient Planet Gods? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, you're doing a good job. And the average person has got some chance of seeing a video of yours. The average person is never going to hear about Ev Cochran. Exactly. That's, what I, that's why I brought him to the light. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, make a, a number of very in fact you know you might be better off with videos which are 20 or 30 minutes you know rather than make anybody wade through two hours you know because what i find is that yeah. like when, when people go to watch videos which are an hour and a half or two hours they oftentimes end up reading the first third of it you know or watching the first oh yeah third yeah that's right right um sounds good greg um, yeah I want to reconsider this whole question of, like, uh, Troy's book and... Um, yeah. Well, I'm into all this. You know, I love it. And I've been supporting you since I first heard you on uh, that show in Alaska, that radio show. I was like, wow, this is some oh, good yes. shit. Yeah, it, it, Allison, Allison. Allison Van Eck. Um, yeah. Okay. One of the things to keep in mind about Herbert Harris things 
is what uh, Walt Thornhill has said, which is that the standard explanation that you see, you know, and also these jets, these these Birkeland currents that you see coming through the middle of uh, spiral galaxies are supposed to be jets of gas, gases. Yeah. Material. You know that. Yeah. Her, well, Thornhill says that's ridiculous. You know that, like, you're talking about the vacuum of space, right? That stuff would dissipate so fast. I mean, it would it would never, it would never form jets. Yeah. Right. You, you know, it would yeah. just instantly, instantly, bam. You know, it would be. Yeah, no, no, what you're seeing is, is, is you know, these linear currents, right, these pairs of yeah. currents, right. We've got, a, um, we've got a, a Birkeland current that runs straight through the center of our own galaxy. Exactly. Right? And what do they call that? They call that the, um, the, 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 I, I can, call the double helix nebula. The double right? helix nebula, yeah. Yeah. I know. You can see pictures of that, right? And the other thing we don't have in the middle of our own galaxy is any sort of a black hole. You know, that, no, that's, man, that's that's all silly talk. That's just to keep people occupied so they don't see the truth. Yeah, no, that's. I always thought intelligence spread honesty, but I guess that's not true. No, um, well, I tell you, one thing that gets to me about, uh, and you might want to do some sort of a little short video about this, right? It's like the question of the. Um, it's another thing that I've whomped up for the benefit of the LaRouche group here recently, you know, the the thing about the Cydonia complex on Mars. Mm -hmm. The fact that between NASA and Google, that they've somehow contrived that most of the time when anybody does a Google search on face on Mars, it turns up that 1976 low-resolution image, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. They've tried to keep in circulation forever and ever and ever. Well, that'll end our conversation. I had turned the recorder off and we chatted a bit longer, which would have probably just bored you and forgot to record the goodbye. But Ted said goodbye and we had a good time. This was kind of an impromptu last minute thing. I hope you enjoyed the talk. You know, one thing I noticed about us humans, if we can ever somehow overcome our schizophrenia, we have to address our greatest problem, and that is blind submission to leaders that have no human compassion, good sense, or ability to think clear. That's the reason why the world is in the shape it's in. And for some reason, the worst minds among us rise to the top and become these worship kings. We're just too willing to be followers. We don't have to agree all the time. And we have our likes and our dislikes. I can honestly say, I don't think to my knowledge. I've ever let information I thought I've known for so long that I had to protect it. And I see a major pushback from the fundamental Christians and Muslims on the Book of Thomas. I mean, what they think they know has been drilled into them for so long, they get institutionalized. It's like prison. First you hate it, then you get used to it, then you depend on it because it doesn't promote church doctrine. I hope you enjoyed the chat, and the world needs to take another look at these Neanderthals. I happen to agree with Ted on that. We agree on a lot. Some things we don't agree on. It's like that with everybody. He's always interesting, though. The world isn't quite what we think it is. I mean, we only have this tiny amount of information. Last thing I want to do is have a closed mind or let church dogma steer the boat. For example, all these huge brain skulls in Central and South America. What's the story on them? Science doesn't even admit they exist. Are those the Nephilims? What about all the myths and legends about dwarves and elves and hobbits and so on? I mean, with the planet gods, we say yes, the ancients were telling us our history, so should we just dismiss that myth because it doesn't fit? I don't think so. We need to investigate it. For example, back in 1930, Somewhere around there, prospectors in the Pedro Mountains of Wyoming found this guy, one and a half foot tall. They wanted to find out, they x-rayed him, and of course he disappeared. Now the Smithsonian is said to be dumping giant bones in the ocean, and on the New Earth Channel that she has gone through these underground dwellings that were made for children, it looks like. Really? That doesn't make much sense. As far as Neanderthal being related to humans, I don't buy it. Science says cro just showed up 37,000 years ago, or thereabouts. Then there was the whole Piltdown Man issue, where basically mainstream science cheated for 40 years. So there's still no missing link to be found. I think they're doing their best to humanize Neanders so it can fit into their theory. Square peg in a round hole. Sounds familiar. Then there are these guys. You know, 
I mean, things are very chopped up. There is this whole thing with the Neanders and cro and we assume this was some place at the dawn of human existence on Earth. Even modern archaeology claims these cro just appeared out of the blue. That much we think we know. And what about the giants? There was a whole period of time when they existed, when men were like grasshoppers at their feet. But he also has some very valid points. I am very open to seeing the evidence that Ted has uh, presented, and he builds himself a case. So I'll be paying attention to that for sure. If there's anything you know or you want to contribute to the conversation, please leave a comment. I like to read the comments, and I usually answer them. Either me or Ted will get to you, because I know he reads these. He's very passionate about his theory, and that's good. Music. All right. Take care. I'll see you on down the road. Know thyself. All the evidence suggests that human beings, as we know them, did not originate on this planet.